first thing I wanted to address was sensors. A little bit of a follow-up from the work that I did with Dennis. And really a lot of that deals with boundary conditions. And by boundary condition, let's go back to what Mike said. Mike's definition of a test is, do you accurately represent in the simulation or in the lab what you were trying to, what you were getting on the track? Okay. An important part of that is sensors. To be able to know your boundary conditions. Everybody knows if I say, okay, take an ICP, run it at uh, 100 hertz, say it's got a range of 3 hertz to 3K or something like that, and I'm going to run it at, you know, 100 hertz, and I'm going to run it at 80% of full scale at room temperature. Uh, you're going to get good data. That's great. Now as you start to deviate from that. And deviate from that is, okay, well, we're going to take that sensor and we're going to run it at not, a lot of people go out and they'll say, well, buy a sensor at 500 Gs, surely I can do a 5G test for that. Hmm. Okay, or they'll run it at temp, or they'll run it at, at, with a profile that has resonances that may be out of bound for your acquisition, and then filter it and think that it's okay. And all these things causes, cause problems. So in the case of what we primarily looked at with Dennis was low frequency response and how do we act. So, you know, obviously people look at sensors and one of the first things that they come up with is frequency response. That's the first thing that they look at. Okay, so if we have a range and Kim asked the question, where does ICP kick in? Okay, and we're gonna put somewhere around say you know, I would say 10 hertz traditionally, and I got one hertz down here, and okay, then we would say DC could theoretically cover it up to the point where DC resonates. So you always want to avoid resonance on any accelerometer. It's going to cause problems. But if we look at this, one of the issues that you've got is say this is one hertz and it's a DC accelerometer. This gets back to the temperature component. This would be 0 0.1, 0 0.01. And how far does that go? What's the bandwidth of it? anything called DC? Zero hertz. It keeps going. And it is as long as you run it. And everybody goes, well, what is the biggest problem? Why not go out and get a sound card? Why is a sound card cheap and a data acquisition system more expensive? Well, we go through a lot of work to make things have low temperature drift. So when Alex said, uh, or, you know, he walks in and he says, okay, we got an Indevco. And uh, he opens the room and we go, Psh! wind hits it, and all of a sudden it changes. You know, that's a temperature drift. Okay, and you want to avoid that. That's an unwanted feature. So every sensor, a good sensor, should be designed to emphasize the parameters, the physical parameters that you're looking at, and avoid all the stuff you don't want. So temperature drift, low no noise, you don't want noise coming through, odd resonances at some point. So you want the physics of the parameter that you're trying to measure, not the physics of the sensor. But like Dennis said, no sensor is perfect. We're trying to get the perfect sensor, but we're not always right there. Okay, And it is something that you need to take into consideration because the idea is, is that is what your system and your model is looking at. This is the lens through which whenever you do a test, that's how it sees the data. And all depending on the type of test that you're doing, what you're trying to do, different things like, is it an acquisition? Is it going to end up as a simulation? Does phase matter? Timing matter? Absolute or relative? And absolute and relative, I'll give you a, a simple two-second thing. If I'm going to take something and I'm going to be, have a phase shift of, say, 45 degrees and be 3 dB down, but I'm going to play that back on a simulator, does that really matter? Let's well, think about this. Recorded with that yes, you're recorded with it, and the simulator will automatically compensate and reproduce that model within bounds. I mean, obviously, you can't be 20 dB down and try to get and crank anything up if there's any significance there. But within small little fluctuations, that'll work. Well, that is across that whole range. So if we look back at this thing here, one of the main concerns that we had was phase response and amplitude response. So then Dennis sent it back to me and goes, well, what's an easy way to check this. Well, one of the things that I wanted to do was first look at it from the standpoint of my system. 
So Dennis talked to the application, but I looked at it from the standpoint of the system. So what I have here is, it's a test running. And if we look, I can go to plots right here. Okay. And this is two Excels running. And this is an easy way if you, theoretically, you would have to have a 19 inch stroke to replicate 1G at 1 hertz. So the problem is, is frequency goes up as the square of the frequency. So that, say for instance, 20 inches, we'll use it, would turn into 0.2 inches at 10 hertz. <clears throat> so a lot of the Cal data sheets I'll show you will typically be You'll see a Cal data sheet that looks like this. This is one that PCB was good enough to give me. So I said, okay, if I'm looking at your calibration, uh, it's still in DB. Sorry, Dennis, that's just the way they produce it, which your DB is right here. Okay, which are pretty tight, but they did give you one other thing. You have a phase plot here. And if you notice, they, they, in this case, most ICP accelerometers would give you um, down to like 10 hertz. I see a lot of Cal data sheets on that. And the problem is, is if you're going to use it below 10 hertz, you're going to ask yourself, well, is it good data? If a guy came in and, and held a gun to your head and said, well, what's it doing at 5 hertz? What's it doing at 3 hertz? What's it doing at 1 hertz? The answer is, I know, no idea. You know, I mean, you got a cal sheet that goes down to 10 hertz. If you're 17025 and you're a lab and you got to show data for that, it's no good. So when I saw this one, the first things I said, I called PCB and I said, give me a data sheet for that that goes the whole way down to the frequency of interest. Okay. So number one, you see, if we're running around one hertz, which is the lower limit. And the reason that I checked one hertz is, is that Dennis and Mike, if you could confirm, within, the, within a car, your lowest is about 1.6 hertz, any, any motion that you're really going to get. And, uh, you know. So I said, OK, let's just make, keep it simple, go to 1 hertz, because when I have a discussion, the math works out easier. So I don't have to remember odd numbers. How does that sound? Plus two, you're a little bit lower than you need to be. So this is the data that we had. So then I looked at it and I said, OK, well, now I need to test that data to see what's happening, see what the shift would be going from, say, for instance, this, which is ideal. Now, there would be one piece of information that I would want to know. And who do you, which was, if it's not supplied, which is, what is the front end that they used it on in the cow lab? You know, and then there's rumors. Some people say you want to be 10 times lower on frequency. That's what ICP says. Other people say, well, it depends on what, what the parameters are you're looking for. We're going to discuss that in a bit. So here's what our front end is currently doing. Okay, we have one hertz and it's tunable. Okay, so we can go down. And you ask yourself, well, why do we choose one hertz? Well, a lot of this comes from years and discussions uh, being with people. Um, there's a time constant. Uh, one hertz is a time constant of 1.6 seconds. And does everybody know what one time constant is? Okay, it's the settling time. So one time constant gets you to 62% of the target value. So if I took and put a square wave in, say going from 0 to 1G, doesn't really matter, 0 to 1 volt, that in 1.6 seconds I will get to 62% of that value. And in typically uh, four time constants would be 6.4 seconds, which gets you about to 98%. And for the most part on accelerometers, if you're within that 2% range, those are the cows you get back. I don't think anybody's going to hem and haw about that, that you're pretty close at that. Now you ask yourself, well, this is an AC coupled device. So why would I ever get a DC step value? Well, you get DC step values whenever you do things to accelerometers, like overrange them. Or imagine if this is our frequency plot, and I have a filter here. So we're going to 
look at an ICP this way. So we're looking at this end. Up here would be the cutoff. Up here is our sample rate. So I'm going to pull some numbers out. And then th your data would have to be well below here. And Nyquist says that you want to sample at least two times over. So if you want to get, let's say, in a road simulator, 50, 100 hertz data. Choose 100 because it keeps the math easy. You would want 200 minimum, but 200 as a in the frequency domain is believable. In the time history domain would absolutely look like so you really want to be out here at, say, 500. 512 is a common number. So you got 512 R1K. Now, we're filtering here. Imagine if some event happens at a higher frequency that we don't know about. And I'll give you an example. Use an accelerometer. There are two things. One, use an accelerometer to 10% of its range. And what happens? Your noise looks crappy. You know, if you start getting down too low. If you do it too high, if you have that, imagine that PSD that you looked at a little bit earlier, and you had some, you had some real energy up here. Well, just because you're filtering it out doesn't mean it didn't affect the accelerometer in the front end. Typically, when those clip out, they appear like DC drifts and offset to that accelerometer. Now, uh, a case, Mike, many years ago you called me and you said, well, I have a PCB, on a quartz accelerometer. I was going into a B&K amp. And you had it, I believe, at 0.2 or 0.1 hertz. And uh, a common thing would be you have uh, an accelerometer that's quartz-based. You're using it on a brake test, and you drive through a water puddle. And water gets up on that. Well, you're going to get an instant temperature change. And that temperature change is going to do two things. One, it's going to actually physically condense or expand the housing that your shear base crystal's in, and it can cause all kinds of other things. So there are things that can cause it, and that time constant that things need to stabilize back out then starts to matter. So um, the number I have is 1 hertz. It's tunable down, uh, down below that. I would not go below 0.1 hertz. You know, I think it's just a bad idea because things change at that point. Uh, any questions on this particular topic? Like this idea of like low end stuff. I'm going to continue and I'm going to show you some examples of what we got going on. So, uh, so in a, in a typical world, to get acceleration, 1 hertz, 1 G would be 19.5 inches or 20 inches of stroke. So a common way to get around this is to use Mother Earth. A G is a G. We don't care where it comes from. If it was a DC accelerometer, the common thing to do is just do a 2G tip. Is it right? I do it all the time. You know, okay, 2Gs. Eh, my scaling factor is probably okay. It ain't a cow lab but it'll do for that, you know, as a quick sanity check. In an ICP world, you can't do that. You go, and what do you end up with? A spike that goes one way and the other, and lots of luck. You can kind of look at the spike, but not really. It ain't so good. So to make this easier, I just made a simple little rig like this, which allows us to, I'm going to bounce it, okay, and we are going to, here are the displays. And there's two signals. Okay. Now, the yellow one is the DC accelerometer. And basically, what we've got here is a pendulum and two excels. So, the most common technique to cal an excel is two ways. You could either A, physically get something to move 19 inches, and through the physics of it, or B, put a, another accelerometer on it that you know is cald, and then just move it in some fashion so you can cal it. So that's all I'm doing here. My reference right now is the planet is generating the g-force, and if you notice, the one settles out, the blue one, the other one stays. That's the DC accelerometer. You rock it, it's back and forth, and we see what's going on there. To check the phase, you're just going to do an XY plot. And uh, 
you notice is that's rotating around. It's out of phase. Each one is a lesser amplitude and it's rotating in. Okay. As it goes. If we uh, let's cancel this back out. Let's go to here. So does anybody have any idea what's going on right there? Okay, not any idea, but any questions it's about persistence. that? Persistence. Well, yeah, it's just persistence, but you're showing it's, it drinks right up and then it comes in. Okay, now what I'm going to do is if we did want to tighten this phase up, which we don't necessarily have to to be able to do effective testing with this, as long as we get back to where Kim was, is we're not trying to use this as an absolute measurement. We're going to simulation. We stay ICP on the acquisition, ICP on the simulation. If we were ICP on the acquisition and say DC on the simulation, then all this comes into play to be in a really big problem. And this is going to be the setup for the next part, which is these are both analog signals. World changes when all of a sudden you get into wheel force transducer where you have digital pads and analog signals. And that's when things start to get real complicated. And then it even gets really bad when you go into CAN, where CAN is a asynchronous, basically. It's kind of coming whenever you get. Now, most people would not ever simulate on CAN data. Not <coughs> CAN data being traditional CAN requested off of an ECU as opposed to CAN data being produced by the Kistler, the Michigan Scientific Box. Okay, so we could tighten that phase up a little bit. If I go back to here. Okay, so we're going to record locally. So I'm going to get two data sets. And then the other data set I'm going to get Well, here, I'm even going to do one other data set too, which is if I take the same thing, and I'll show you how the phase looks relatively fine here with a higher frequency. So this is just a shaker. Okay, you can't really hear it. It's going to go on in a second. Well, you probably can. Mike, you're right. <laughs> okay. And if we do a, um, we're going to bounce them to the row zero. And now we're going to put our shaker in. And we're going to do a little capture. Okay. This is the DC. This is the AC. Okay. It's a little difference chattering around. It's a bigger thing. We're not going to worry about that. If we do an FFT on that. 20 hertz, approximately. Uh, that'll be a little bit cleaner. It's not chattering around. This isn't exactly mounted. Mount. I would never advocate putting an Excel on with electrical tape. But for the sake of this argument, it's, it's fine. <laughs> that would fail you right from the beginning. OK. But what we can notice is that if we uh, do a recording, We review the data set. We're pretty much in phase with the stock front end at 20 hertz. That phase shift is very small. I think most people could live with that. And the amplitudes are relatively close. So at that point in time, uh, there's really very minimal phase shift. And that phase shift is going to be an accumulation of the front end and the accelerometer. OK. I'll do one last thing on this before I move off. So if we then get rid of our I'm just going to show these two. Okay, now I'm going to put a 0.1 hertz front end on.
You can see that settling time. It's long. Let's close that. We're going to clear the display. It's still going down. You know? So uh, it's going to take a little while, but we can do close enough to just do the one check that we want to do, which is just if I rock this, now our phase is really pretty good. So just something to be cognizant of. You guys can choose it however you want, and uh, you just need to be cognizant of what's going on at that point. Are there any questions on this so far? Adapter in the Yeah, it's just an adapter in the cap. It's a, it's a front end wrap around. So, okay, so let's look at this idea of delay. Does anybody have any, before I move off on that, does anybody want to look at anything more relating to sensors? I mean, sensors themselves can be a loaded topic. I mean, I'll give you an example. I get requests from people to do different functions, you know. The, different tricks and all this within it. The case with Dennis was I want to go negative one gain or negative gains. Well, why would you want negative gains? You have an Excel with an orientation and that orientation, if it's an ICP, is fixed. So you cannot change that orientation. So what are the chances of you throwing a Triax Excel on a model and being able to make sure that all your things are positive? So you're probably going to want to get and say, oh, well, maybe get X and Y axis in or Z or out, something like that. So this was an easy way to flip this. Now, Steve asked me, well, why not flip it in the transform? Well, you could do that. Uh, and that's what a lot of people did. But the way that it works on the acquisition process is we have an A to D. We have a DAC out. And TCS is not unlike most packages. You have a computer there and you have the power of a computer. So that computer is doing all the transforming for you. Very few units actually do all the transforming right on the box themselves. You know, it gets, uh, we do gain and when, then we'll do offset. Offset is in the form of bounce and gain are just gain corrections to make sure that it's right. Okay. So if we were coming out of here, say we're minus one here. Well, on the DAC out, we're going to be minus one. But TCS, if we flipped it here to get it back, it would be one. Now, if I take that data and go back and I say, okay, I want to close the loop on a simulator. So the DAC would be driving your simulator, doing outer loop control, which would then be driving your model. Well you start getting quickly into how many times do I have to flip, flip phase on this file and I have to track all that stuff. So then you're better off having a file or a data set that doesn't, the less manipulation you have to do, the better off your chances of not screwing it up. Because there's always going to be the next guy and if you say, it's all about knowing everything that occurred on the process. And from that, Oh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's disastrous because uh, here's what happens. We already have a car, and we have accelerometers that may be placed where they're going to be. We don't know the orientation. Then we're going to go down, and some guy that's down the path has to know that that was not changed. And maybe you can write it as a note on something. This was inverted or something like that. But the more of that you have to do, the higher the likelihood that you're going to screw it up. So you really want to keep it as simple as you possibly can and not at least introduce variabilities because the variabilities are going to be your enemy. Everything from when you took the data to when you fixture it. And where Mike's complained about he has all these problems with, oh, here it is, I'm trying to get this thing set up and I got to have it phase correct and I need to be able to go out to 1,000 hertz. Well, lots of luck. My God, there's a million things that are just going to kill you on that that make it different from the model on the road. So it's important to sort of mirror that model on the road thing. So that was one example of such a thing where you are trying to minimize that. Another example of just where something 
Very helpful can get you into trouble. We talked about in DevGo accelerometers earlier, the old bounce beam type ones. Say I have a bounce beam Excel and I drop it. So I got a request many years ago. This goes back probably 25 years when I did the first Megadac. And it was like, well, can we bounce and can we expand that bounce range out? And I go, well, why do you want to do that? Well, we have accelerometers that are out of bounds. Hmm, why are they out of bounds? They shouldn't be. A good accelerometer better be within a notable range. So if somebody comes to me and they say, I have an accelerometer that has a 45% of full-scale offset. Well, basically what that tells me is that accelerometer was dropped, that beam was deformed, and you may be able to zero it. And it may act like an accelerometer. But I guarantee you, if you put that on a shaker, you'll see nonlinearities and distortions all over the place. This thing will want to go. If the acceleration goes far enough, this will want to pop the other way. Yeah, so even if you're oil filled and all that stuff, it's not going to make any difference. That is basically a piece of garbage that has been made to look OK through bounce. So you have to be careful. There are things that. Most modern day acquisition systems do a very good job of cleaning it up. And that includes things like filtering and uh, bounce and how that's approached and a bunch of other things. But you still, the sensor plays a very, very important part of this whole thing. I'm going to leave sensors for a second. And I'm going to talk about. Okay. This is what a block diagram of uh, most data acquisition systems looks like. We just I show the front end there because I made this a little while ago to uh, discuss how our front end set up, how calibration works, ESD protection on the front end, okay, and how the cal routing is. And, and what that really works out. We go through a programmable gain amp, and then we have a low pass filter and a 24 bit converter. Okay. So, one of the areas I had a discussion many years ago when uh, Mars Labs was carried by BNK, and I got in front of a group of people and I talked to people about sampling techniques. Uh, phase shifts and delays and what it meant to them. And I was surprised at the number of people that all of a sudden said, oh, you mean that could happen to my data? And they've been taking data for a very, very long time. And uh, I said, yeah. And they go, well, how do we look at that data and determine what went on? And I said, well, you really can't. There are indicators, but some of it is salvageable. Some of it is not salvageable, depending on what the problem is. Now, I'm going to talk to the same topic, but in a different sense. And it's really about phase delays and people's knowledge of what phase delays would be and how this data lines up. So I have a box sitting right here that consists of, this would be your front end filter. It's going to sample and then reconstruct, okay? That reconstruction, which is going to call the cutoff frequency, can happen analog-wise or it can be in your software. And most people, this is in software. So what happens is, is the data gets digitized and then when you show a few points here and your software conveniently draws connected dots there to make a nice sine wave, that's it interpolating what it thinks it is. And there are different modes that you could use. You could use a triangle, a straight line. OK, but what would that triangle do? Let's, let's even go simpler. Let's say that you did something like this. Square wave. OK, so what is the difference between a square wave a triangle wave and a uh, sine wave. The energy that's on your Spectral energy. Yeah. So any waveform can be constructed.
from sine waves. Any waveform. You take enough sine waves, throw it at it, adjust the phase, adjust the amplitudes, and the digital sampling process just takes slices here, here, and here, assuming you buy into this Nyquist theory. This would be a two times over sampling model. Okay. And it would reconstruct that then in your software. Well, knowledge of how much of that reconstruction is occurring and the rules under that helps you when you start to push the limits the other way. So earlier in my conversation, I, all, I talked about low end and sensor dynamics. This is going towards the other side of things. And people used to use some scary sample rates and, and do things. Um, I'll give you an example. Since John Yachtman's not here, I can use his name. <laughs> sample rates of 204.8. So we're out here at 204.8, which is a common rate of, I call it a very 80s based rate. This was at a time where you didn't have much stuff. And then, so we're at here, and in theory, you could go one, 102 hertz. In theory. Okay. Now, the problem is, is you have a filter that's here. Okay, and a common filter that everybody used in that day was eight pole, was one model. But then if you bought crappier things, they might be three pole. And a three pole would be out here. Okay, and a simple way to think of it is it's 6 dB per pole. So this right here would be 48 dB per octave. Okay, this would be 18 dB per octave. Now, why does this filter matter? Okay, if this filter... If there's any energy above 102 hertz and that filter hasn't removed it, it's going to start to reflect back into here. Because you, at that point you have violated the sampling theorem and you're going to reflect back and that's going to appear like low energy. And the only tricks that you can use is, is you, it's all knowledge of your model. But even at that point, you have out-of-band stuff that's been reflected back to in-band, and it's just going to screw you up all over the place. Now, why could they get away with that? In some instances, the mechanical model, this is just electrically what we're doing. The mechanical model, if it doesn't have anything up there, who cares? You know, if I have it hooked up to a car and it's running around and there's nothing above 50 hertz, we're okay. But we know there's all kinds of things, clink clanks and stuff like that, things jumping around, and they could potentially be maybe artifacts of other types of stuff, other uh, events that are not within the modes that we're looking at. So I have a rig set up here. Okay, so this is a 500 hertz signal. And first I'm going to show it on a scope. Okay. And what I'm going to do is very tune down the filter. The first signal is the input. The second is after that filter. So that's after our first stage filter. And if you notice, here we go through 180 degrees out of phase. And by the cutoff, of this eight pole filter, which you can now see it's starting to attenuate, we have shifted 360 degrees. So the first question is, is if you're simulating and you have a 180 degree flip, what happens? Yeah, well, not only that, you got a perfect oscillator. You are, that is an unstable system in any simulations. Okay, so that's going to be, if there is energy there, first you have to realize that you're shifting. So when these people used to try to get down into the slope of this filter to acquire, that it would cause problems with un potentially unstable data. Okay, now the second thing where we can go in is we can say, okay, I'll just show you. We have a square wave. There's a square wave. And... We are at 
adding and removing harmonics. That's all that filter is doing. And if we look at that spectrally, these are our harmonics. Okay. So our square wave has harmonics of 1, which would be 500 hertz, 3, 5, 7, 9 times the fundamental. And all that that's doing is it's taking them back out. So that data is not there to cause a problem. Okay. Now, if we go back to a sine wave, sine wave is just fundamental. Okay. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to chop the signal up. And this is basically what any digitizing system does. It's pretty much transparent to you because, again, you guys are seeing the data at the other side of this thing. But um, stop it. This is the sample rate. And this is what the waveform looks like chopped up. So we're digitizing that waveform. And higher sounds like a sine wave. Yeah, because that's all above kind of what we can hear. But notice as I start to drive down, to the point where I go below, now we're in Nyquist, and that starts dropping. Okay, what does that look like spectrally? Those are all coming down. And anything that's in this band here, you have no idea where it's coming from. Okay, that's all coming from just your fact that you're undersampling. You're not sampling fast enough. Now, what we can do is a common thing is you say, okay, well, now we've got these. So what we're going to do. I'll show it to you first in the time history. Now we can filter those out. So the, notice how it's in there. And I can, this is the sampled waveform, and I'm just removing harmonics. Now, as I drop down, I can still kind of reconstruct that into a waveform that looks pretty close to what you need to do. And in the spectral domain, You're just removing those harmonics. But this is why you can't fix those other files. If I drop that down, now I have a harmonic below that. I can't get rid of it. Okay, that was a little bit of a mouthful there. I don't know how much it really, as systems get newer, all this matters less. But it still matters even today, you know. Uh, we can't, in, in a Mars Labs box, you can't really alias. But you can't overdrive front ends. And most people, there are situ situations where you can't overdrive front ends. 
Uh, when you reconstruct or apply high pass or low pass filters, I was having that conversation with you, Dennis, about what are the frames that you do. So a lot of people do post filtering. Okay. And uh, it, uh, you, you have to be cognizant of the delay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and look at, imagine if I had that delay, and the delay is always there. This is what does matter today, and this has made the problem more complex. I have a signal here. This is a wheel force transducer, and this is what we did with you, Mike. And I have an Excel. Okay? And it's attached to the same wheel. This goes through your... and gets sampled by the DAC. This, I'm going to draw components out, but this goes through a filter. This is all internal into the data acquisition system and sampled. Okay. Now, what you're going to do is later you're going to do a simulation where you're going to mix those together. Okay. Now, the difference between real-time control and a system that doesn't matter, it's, it's real-time like, is, is that as long as everything sees the same delay and you're not doing control with it, it doesn't matter. If I collect a data set and I collect a data set an hour from now, it doesn't care. It's all relative. And that relativistic thing lets you get away with that. Okay, so if we go back to our first sheet, which was just for the points of discussions. But in control, it does matter. In control, it matters a lot. Now, on an MTS rig, what happens is We'll take this out and we'll put this into a DAC. So I'm going to first talk about acquisitions and then simulations. Okay. So on an acquisition, these I guarantee you will probably be different because this is taking one route and this is taking the other route. So much the way we had a 2G tip, what is the easiest way to figure out what that's doing? Yeah, go out, get yourself a rubber mallet. <laughs> And just put the Excel on the WFT, hit it, and then line it up. Okay. Now, that's important because if everything's there, Mike, you know what timing problems can do to you. Drive you nuts. <laughs> you know, there are timing problems that may occur for lots of reasons. This is one timing problem you want to avoid. A lot of people will look at it. The smart guys will look at it and continuously realign that stuff back up. Uh, within Titan... Under export, we have this thing called export value, and we have delay options. And once you've determined what that delay is, uh, you can just put it in there. Then whenever you export, it will be lined back up. Now, I will say that that delay is only legitimate for that test at those filter values. Okay, If you change filter values or you change the sample rate, then that could affect that in either case because it's, you know, there's processing time. To go from here into the electronics to here all take processing time. And all that processing time can get you. Uh, who's using wheel force? Who's doing a case that this may affect them? I don't know. You're not doing simulations, Steve, so it's not so much for you. Uh, your biggest thing would be if you're taking mixing devices. So you were doing an acquisition with a mixed device. Let's so say you had sensors here. Anything that goes into this, say the analog front end, everything is going to see the same item. Same delays, same sample rate, so it all negates out. Phase-wise, they're locked. Sample-wise, they're locked, so there's really no problem. But if you get into different system types, so if you're doing CAN data mixed with other things, and timing does matter, you have to decide how much it matters and then determine what do you need to do to correct that. If you don't care, then it's kind of a moot point. Okay.
Does anybody else? Kim, do you run into this much? Um, <clears throat> the only thing with timing is, is sometimes shock type of uh, people are looking for uh, shock testing. Is it just because and it's higher frequency? Very high. Yeah. Yeah. They, they always seem to want the moon for the, the sample rate, uh, mm -hmm. which I run into just recently in LMS. Or somebody with an LMS front end at 200K sample, they were just wound up excited because they seem to be able to reach a little bit higher amplitude because of the, yeah. the sample rate, which I think is a little over Yeah, stressed, and it, but. in a control system, so we actually are talking control, there are delays all over the place. It's just one delay after another. The sensor is a small amount of delay. We saw that from the PCB one. Filters certainly have delay, and those delays can be significant. Okay, the A to D process has delays. If we're going to DAC, we have, it has delays. Okay, so typically, in almost any system that you're doing that, this can never be fast enough to be able to compensate for the loop delay to be able to have a stable system. So there are some guidelines that people have, which is you want to be 10 times faster minimum than you're actually trying to control. What do we got there? Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, so you want to be 10 times faster. I don't know what you guys, I mean, the loop rates are pretty high these days on a lot of these things, but the minimum would be 10 times faster. So this to this here in a Titan system, and it's going to be everything else, is about 30 milliseconds. Okay. And that's 30 milliseconds at, say, 512 with a 100 and, I believe, 100 hertz filter. That's what that is. And those values are published. So when you actually do a simulation, with any simulator, you've got inner loop and outer loop control. And this is what's called the outer loop. So the inner loop would be your driver to your actuator to a little thing that feeds back, and it is very tightly controlled. Saying, OK, we want to get in control of this. We want this actuator to move this much and it's got to move within that amount. This is typically entered, I know uh, I don't work so much with other systems, I don't know, but in, in RPC when you're working with a 329 type rig, be it the old ones or a flex test or something like that, this is a value that you would enter in and software wise they compare 30 milliseconds later that data. So they're constantly comparing that data to sort of get around. Okay, that's enough on that. Topic. Does anybody have any questions on this? I, it's kind of like, good. Either you totally understand it, you don't understand it, or it doesn't matter to you. I think it's all about knowing your system. Right? Yes. Well, yeah, exactly. So if you get back to what Mike said, the sensors, the acquisition system, the simulator, how the data is handled and reconstructed and processed, how the data is taken, the physical location of mounting your model and analysis of it are all part of replicating. Any area in there that breaks down um, can cause problems. And, and the only reason that I went through this was when I went through this with BNK in a world of mechanical engineers, they took this all for granted. They assumed that if they were plugging in and this is what was going on, they, they thought, well, I just plug it in, I take data, and here's what comes out. There were really never any questions about it. And then when I started to bring it up, I'm a double E that likes mechanics, but I'm not an ME. But that's where the bridge met, and uh, I think it was uh, appreciated that some people understood it.